Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a <coughs> pleasure to be back here. Actually, my first time at WIDER was 30 years ago, so it was one of the first conferences uh, here. Um, and it's also good to get an opportunity to talk about, take a few steps back, talk about broader issues rather than getting bogged down to a lot of the more focused project-oriented stuff um, <coughs> I'm engaging with at, uh, at FAO. Um, it's not an easy task to follow the act of uh, parents and David, uh, and actually they've already uh, cut out a lot of the ground I uh, uh, wanted to cover, so it actually have made my life easier. But um, uh, Tony and Finn asked me to talk in particular about uh, the links between agriculture, and growth, and, and poverty. So maybe I'll add a, a few elements more on those points. Um, <clears throat> to start, um, uh, that's what we mentioned. Um, um, uh, we produce enough food in the world, but still we have quite a bit of uh, malnutrition, as uh, defined by undernourishment. Uh, um, and we have also what Per called the hidden um, uh, hunger in terms of micronutrient uh, deficiencies. But it's also linked with the still 1 billion extreme poor uh, we have in the world. So not for nothing, the first two SDGs are to eradicate poverty and eradicate hunger in the sense of uh, malnutrition or undernourishment. Um, now, we've made a lot of progress. Um, we've reached the global target of having, uh, as the, one of the graphs of uh, Pear showed, of having the, the incidence of uh, undernourishment. Um, although not in terms of having the number of people in undernourishment. But also very clear is that progress has been very uneven, and particularly uh, with most of the people that are poor and in food insecure are stuck <coughs> in South Asia and Africa. And although I, I agree with, um, with David when he says, well, income increases not necessarily translate into better nutritional outcomes, but... The ones that we identify as undernourished and the extreme poor do tend to coincide, and mostly, most of them, by far most of them, live in rural areas. According to the latest World Bank estimate, 78% of them, and that's the people living on less than $1.25 per day. So what this means is that even though we have solved maybe a global food security problems just by the availability, um, it's not solved in terms of access to food for everybody, which means that our food systems are highly inefficient and unequal. Also, if we want to eradicate over the next 15 years, which is the promise of the SDGs, uh, both poverty and hunger, we probably need new and different approaches. Um, if you look at those that are still under the extreme poverty line, and even though the cohorts may have changed, but the World Bank recently did some uh, analysis over a long period of time, those that are in the category of below the $1.25 per day poverty line, their income increases over the past 35 years, right, since 1980, have been 5%. Not per year, but for the whole period. So meaning going on average from, if I recall well, from 74 cents <clears throat> purchasing power parity dollars to 75 to 78 cents, right? So what it means is that from all the income growth that, that there's been, they have not been able to benefit, but also to get to eradicate poverty and hunger, a lot more needs to happen. Um, probably 15 years may not be enough to achieve that unless we do things differently. Uh, the other common feature is that most of the people we're talking about live in in regions, sub-regions within countries that are uh, disadvantaged in many other ways. Lack of infrastructure, um, uh, lack of services, um, health service, education service, basic services, and so on and so forth. So um, there's other dimensions that we need to uh, look at. And that's going to be my main argument uh, here for the folks on is that um, maybe also we have to reassess the role of agriculture and food systems more broadly in overall growth strategies. 
Um, the reason I emphasize that, because uh, here taking a few steps back on the development of, uh, of um, development economics and our thinking about growth in, in developing countries, it always has started from thinking about your needs. In the first place, agricultural productivity grows in order to jumpstart uh, economic growth more broadly. And Peter Timmer said here, uh, I think a year ago, in his uh, annual lecture, that no country has been able to sustain rapid economic growth until its citizens and investors were confident food was reliably available in the main urban markets. But in order to get there, you need a lot of investments in agriculture first to, to jumpstart that productivity growth. Now, I think that was also understood by the uh, founding fathers of development uh, economics uh, that uh, you need to get that productivity growth in order to release the resources for your industrial development. So going back to Rosenstein, Rodin, Lewis, and, uh, and everybody else. Um, what has been misunderstood, um, possibly also in practice, but maybe also by some of the, the thinkers, is that in order to get there, you truly need to continue investing in agriculture. Otherwise, you don't get sufficient uh, productivity growth that will unleash the labor savings and foreign exchange that's needed to finance uh, your industrial uh, development. Um, uh, but the main thinking also, and I think in, in, um, uh, in Africa in recent decades until very recently, um, the thinking still was, well, we need to industrialize to get urban growth, and that will lift up our economies to the detriment of, uh, of agricultural development. And I think uh, the urban bias that agriculture suffered for a long period of time uh, has been part of that. And often, every now and then, that has been um, um, helped by big pushes, particularly after the 73, 74 global crisis in food, uh, which we also had uh, then, which gave a big push also to the implementation of the Green Revolution that uh, uh, gave a big boost to agricultural productivity growth uh, and also gave rise to the long period of low uh, agricultural and food prices. Um, now, this uh, <clears throat> thinking also with it's a natural pattern that we've seen in the form of structural transformations that with this productivity growth in agriculture, you get a falling share of agriculture and GDP, falling shares of agricultural employment. Um, but it not necessarily means that agriculture is a low productivity sector, unlike many investors uh, think. Right? There's a lot of... Uh, also total factor productivity growth that is going on in the agricultural sector. It's just that the impact on overall growth will decline over time as, um, um, as uh, the economy develops uh, further up the scale. Um, the problem which um, in the transition typically happens, you get widening urban and rural income gaps, uh, which has also given rise to uh, often underinvestments um, in agriculture because of the uh, lower incomes uh, uh, and returns uh, that investors believe can be earned in, in the agricultural sector. The second transformation that has gone on with the overall structural transformation is the changing nature of agriculture in the economy itself. Um, it's a process, typically you get more consolidation of, of land holdings, uh, some, sometimes to very big scale, or medium-sized uh, farms and rural labor out-migration. And what we've seen, which is very important uh, also for understanding the nutritional outcomes we have at um, the moment, is, is that agriculture has been much more part of ever-increasing, ever longer food value chains, right? That's come also with the supermarket revolutions that from just uh, getting your agriculture produce uh, onto the... Um, um, to the markets and then into the, um, into the households uh, on to much more processed food uh, of all sorts uh, in um, uh, each, each time a longer uh, uh, value change. Um, that has come with a lot of the benefits of improved also nutritional conditions, more, more food safety, um, and better quality food, um, which has also fit um, we, the dietary transition um, that has come with income growth and uh, urban growth, and also with the supermarket uh, revolution, as we call it, the sort of more common food habits uh, people have. 
Um, so we get the, these transitions in the nutritional uh, demands. Um, uh, both come with what we call the typical uh, angle law that if the food share uh, of the total income, people, uh, the share of people uh, spent on food will decrease. Uh, but also Bennett's law that says, well, over time with income increases, you shift from the, the basic staples, uh, grains and, and starches on to more high protein food. Now, what's important for the growth story is the implications of that and also the limits to growth. So with that transition to uh, higher protein foods, meats and so on, there's a lot more use, uh, demand for, the, for land use for that for livestock a lot more demand for water use, um, uh, both for the crops that feed the cattle uh, as well as for um, uh, the uh, livestock production itself. Um, and that is uh, put uh, on further burdens on reaching the land frontiers in, in most cases, and also determines what are the possibilities of sustaining sufficient uh, food security around the world moving forward. Um, I'll come back to that, that point um, <clears throat> in a minute. Uh, also, the nature of the, coming back to agriculture transformation, matters for um, poverty uh, reduction. Um, as Fomo had said in the beginning, it's uh, kind of obvious that if most of the poor live in rural areas and also depend on agriculture, that then agriculture development is likely to have a big impact on poverty. And that's also what we find in practice. Um, and oftentimes more than three times uh, more effective agriculture grows to reduce poverty uh, than grows in other sectors. But that seems to be applying most when we get to the poorest of the poor. If you get to the more moderate poor, then non-agricultural income growth becomes uh, more important. Um, but within that, uh, and that will be the challenge also moving forward, if I can get this to work, so look at um, agriculture productivity growth. We've seen um, uh, quite a bit of agricultural productivity growth, but um, at much slower paces than uh, some people think is needed. Um, um, in, the, um, S in the SDGs, there's one under the um, um, SDG 2, there's one of the targets says we want to double productivity growth for smallholder farmers uh, around the world. That's part of both feeding into the food security target as well as into the um, uh, poverty uh, target. Now, <clears throat> what we see in practice, if we take the poorest regions, uh, Africa and, um, and Asia, uh, and this, this plots the um, growth of agriculture labor productivity, so that's the, <clears throat> the value of production per uh, agriculture worker on the um, <clears throat> horizontal axis and land productivity on the vertical uh, axis. Um, so what you see here is that, see most of in the, the countries where smallholder farmers, or the region where smallholder farmers most concentrate, also where there's the, the lower levels of productivity, uh, particularly on the labor productivity side, we see most of the gains in terms of yields per hectare and not in labor productivity. So the, the biggest challenge moving forward is how can we translate um, productivity increases on labor productivity growth if we want to have this win-win uh, solution. Um, OK, let me jump on this. There's uh, other issues to, to discuss. I think one of the important things is what we see in the poverty uh, situations is that we see a reverse land size transitions. Instead of getting more consolidation of land size holding, we see more fragmentation of land size holding. It has to do with increased population growth uh, and poor people having uh, less access to new land uh, and, uh, and so on, and fragmenting through that um, actually production uh, and limiting through that future productivity growth. Um, then there's some uh, geography issues that will come back into my conclusions uh, since I'm running out of time. Um, but I think maybe the major challenge that we're facing is that moving forward to solve the food security and the poverty problem has to be done in a context of climate change and environmental degradation. So all the gains that we've seen uh, over the past uh, decades have been in the context of an agricultural sector that is producing uh, 
one-third of the greenhouse <coughs> gas emissions, uh, is um, um, depleting uh, natural resources. Uh, and through that, if we don't transform agriculture in new ways, uh, then we won't uh, be able to do that. Um, also, everything we do, if we want to do it in a more sustainable way, it has to be done through what we call sustainable intensification. Uh, FEO projects that uh, to feed a growing world population and increasingly urban population, um, global food production will have to increase by 60% between now and 2030. And that will have to come from sustainable intensification also because even if you don't take into account how you produce it in more sustainable ways, is that we have reached uh, the, the land frontier. So basically, most regions of the world, 80% um, uh, or more, except for Latin America and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a little bit more space, everything will have to come from yield increases. Uh, there's very little space to do that through expansion of arable land. So that's a major challenge, which will require um, turning things around. And this time, what we need is a truly green green rev revolution. Um, key point, key message uh, here is this could also give new growth opportunities. Transforming agriculture around that way um, could give, would give new growth opportunities through the investments in R&D, um, but also uh, the through new uh, job opportunities, which I'll mention uh, at my final slide. But before coming to that, um, one transition or transformation, if you like, we haven't talked about is demographic transitions. Um, and uh, in Asia and uh, Africa, but actually worldwide, one of the key problems we're facing are that of aging farmers. The average age of farmers is 60 around the world, not just in Europe, Asia, uh, South, South Asia. Uh, uh, in Japan, but also in South Asia, Africa, the average age of farm is 60. Um, the share of the population in Africa and, and uh, South and East Asia of young people under the age of 25 is also about 60%, right? Um, so if we want to remember one number here is 60, right? 60% 60 increase in food production, age of farmers is 60. <coughs> Uh, the number of young people or the share of young people in the population is about 60. But young people are not that interested anymore to work in agriculture, particularly not in Africa. So one of the root causes of the migration we're seeing is, um, is coming out of that part of where we see more educated young people that don't see a future for themselves in agriculture in rural areas uh, and try to uh, move out. I hear my time is up, so I'll move to my final slide, which um, gives some added uh, suggestions to the ones that Per and uh, David gave. So first point, revisit the role of agriculture in, in growth strategy, even if it's a small share uh, currently of GDP. Um, in the transformation of agriculture, uh, there's new source of growth and also new source of employment. Uh, in one estimation, the ILO has estimated that a more sustainable transformation of agriculture, restoration of soils, uh, forest, and so on, <clears throat> could generate uh, uh, about worldwide about 60 million new jobs, and that's quite uh, significant. But it can also be a source, as I mentioned, of total factor productivity growth. Uh, for the poorest areas, um, I think there's, there's a need to, to also look for um, new ways of looking at, at farming, not just in the form of getting to adopt more sustainable practices, um, but it, there's a lot of scope to do things in more integrated ways, which could simultaneously solve the issues of, um, of poverty, access to food, but also more nutritious food. Um, those things what we call integrated uh, farming systems or integrated agricultural, uh, ecological farming system, which tries to provide multiple livelihoods to farmers, uh, which will produce um, in more sustainable ways um, the food, but also by engaging in multi-crop, polycrop farming that's consistent with those uh, sustainable agricultural practices, um, also provides more nutritious food, uh, both on the farm for the local communities, uh, but also for um, uh, urban uh, areas. Within that, there's a lot of scope, and I don't have time to go into that, 
to entice young people to uh, engage in agriculture. There's a lot of em employment opportunities there, and they also must be in the case of Africa. Um, there's no way that within the next 15 years, uh, non-agricultural sectors can absorb the growing entrance into the labor market. There's about <clears throat> 20 million young people entering into the labor market in Africa uh, every year, and not even at the 10% plus growth of the non-agricultural sectors, urban sectors, uh, uh, that would be enough to absorb uh, the debt uh, growing labor force. So it will have to be a combination of the two. Then my final point is um, we have to, uh, aside from seeing agriculture, industrial justice and agriculture sector as part that is part of the global food systems and food chains, also think more in geographic terms. As I said in the beginning, the poor and the food insecure live in particular areas, um, in geographic areas that need more integrated approaches uh, to uh, uh, rural development as well as to uh, urban development. Um, uh, one of the things we see is that the transition in out of poverty is fastest when it is in combination of agriculture growth with non-agriculture growth in small rural townships and where you concentrate new uh, activities. What we see in practice, take Africa, the urbanization process is mainly concentrating vast populations in larger cities with a disconnect from the uh, urban area. So if we want to invest in infrastructure, we should invest both in rural infrastructure as well as in the infrastructures needed in the small cities in order to strengthen these linkages and through that uh, get to more sustainable structural transformations. Thank you very much. Thank you.